1189, at Chinon in central France, King Henry II was dying. His empire, covering all of England and vast areas of France, was crumbling. What eventually broke the aging king, though, was not the rebellions which threatened his kingdoms, but the discovery that one of the leading rebels was his youngest and favorite son, John. John was a wonderful calculator, but in the end, there was something vicious in him, which is always going to come out, always going to smile to your face and stab you in the back. He was violent, he was cunning, he was witty and uh, fun, uh, but he was also not to be trusted. Throughout his 17-year reign, the man who would be known forever as Bad King John betrayed those closest to him, persecuted the innocent, and was the first king of England to be accused of murder. Writing after John's death, a medieval chronicler said of him, he feared not God, nor respected men. His punishments were refinements of cruelty, the starvation of children, the crushing of old men. His court was a brothel where no woman was safe. John's oppression was so widely felt that the legend of Robin Hood was born the mythic outlaw of Sherwood Forest, who stole from the rich and gave to the poor. Exaggerations, I'm sure, but they were effective exaggerations because they were widely believed. Driven to despair, John's subjects would try to impose a document on him called the Magna Carta, guaranteeing protection of their rights. John's refusal to abide by it would finally drive a desperate people into rebellion. He couldn't stand him. John makes so many people so fed up, so angry, so ashamed, humiliated, that they choose to rebel. And it's just an awful shit. John was born in Oxford on Christmas Eve 1167. The fourth and youngest son of King Henry II, the head of the Angevin dynasty, a family of powerful nobles originating in Anjou in central France. Like William the Conqueror, a hundred years before them, they controlled all of England and vast territories throughout France. He was born into the most powerful family in Western Europe. His father, King Henry II, uh, was not only King of England, but was also Duke of Normandy, Duke of Aquitaine, which is the whole of southwestern France, Count of Anjou, the rich lands in the Loire Valley, and, and was on the eve of invading Ireland and subjecting Ireland to his dominion as well. Henry and his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, had three other sons, Geoffrey, Henry the Younger, and Richard, later known as Richard the Lionheart. As John grew up, that family fell apart, became a classically dysfunctional family. For John, bad relations with his brothers were exacerbated by the fact that as the youngest son, his claim to any lands and entitlements was always unclear. John was haunted by the fact that his father, King Henry II, gave him the nickname Lackland. To amend this in 1189, Henry gave the 18-year-old John the governorship of Ireland. One of John's castles still stands at Limerick in the Irish Republic. Whilst there, John exhibited one of his most notorious qualities. Two contemporary commentators comment upon his rapacity and avarice, that he wouldn't pay his soldiers, but seemed very keen to make as much money out of everyone there as he could. So right from the beginning, uh, avarice, greed, uh, is certainly one of the characteristics they pick up. They say they hope he will improve as he gets older. He's just a lad, after all. The real troubles that beset that family were caused largely by his father's love for John and his father's wish to provide for John, a wish which left behind a trail of people who felt themselves to be disinherited in the interests of the youngest son of the family. Things would never change. Regardless of how much his father tried to help him, John's appetite for power 
would always outweigh any sense of loyalty to his father. In the last year or so of his life, Henry was facing great problems from his oldest surviving son, Richard, and the King of France, Philip Augustus, and Henry feared that they might be allying against him. John wasted no time in joining his brother Richard and the King of France in rebellion against his father. It was clear that the future lay with Richard, and therefore John, I think, is just looking to where the advantage is. But it does test his mind to a terrible lack of loyalty to his father. So I think there, there was just self-interest, calculated the future is with Richard, not with my father. Contemporaries wrote about this as the, the final straw that broke the father's heart, that he had gone through so much, he'd made so many mistakes for John's sake. And in the end, it was the son he loved who betrayed him. With Henry's death in 1189, Richard was now the king of England. And though generous to John, John felt no sense of loyalty to his brother. From the time of the succession to the throne of his surviving older brother, Richard, Richard the Lionheart, John was given fantastic wealth, particularly in England, but also in Normandy. And he was also Lord of Ireland. Now, if that wasn't enough for John, it just shows that it would have been impossible to satisfy him. What they don't really give him is the status of an Angevin prince. And so, from almost as soon as Richard sets off on crusade, we see him trying to cause trouble, or being drawn into the troubles which arise from Richard's absence. And he, in the end, took up arms and allied treacherously with the King of France. To John's astonishment, Although Richard had been imprisoned in Germany on his return from the Crusades, he eventually made it back. Worried, John immediately broke off his alliance with the King of France and begged Richard's forgiveness. John falls on his knees before his older brother. Uh, Richard is supposed to say, oh, come on, John, get up. You're just a child. You've been badly advised. Well, by that time, uh, he was nearly 30 years old. So not surprisingly, the French now felt they'd been betrayed by John, who had just betrayed Richard, who had betrayed his father. Amazingly, John still felt entitled to the throne and pressed Richard to be named as his heir. John's claim would have been completely unassailable had it not been for the fact that from 1189, as his father was dying, through to 1194, when his brother was in prison in Germany, John had a track record of treachery, which appalled contemporaries. One of Richard's main concerns was for his reputation, for his honor, that he would do what honor required. John is clearly concerned to remain as rich as possible and as powerful as possible, but, but that honor, I think, never seems to cross his mind at all. Reputations notwithstanding, John would secure the throne. Wounded in battle at Chalousse in central France, Richard died on April the 6th, 1199. On his deathbed, he named John as his heir. John is king by the grace of God. The records of his own household show that he didn't observe feast days, he didn't observe fasts, he ate meat on Fridays, he chatted during mass and everything like that. Once you've met John, it's very difficult any longer to believe this really can be a king by the grace of God, you know, because he's manifestly not a pious man. As king, John felt himself beyond reproach and free to have whatever he wanted when he wanted it, particularly when it came to women. His first marriage to Isabel of Gloucester in 1189 was annulled when she couldn't produce an heir. He then kept Isabella of Gloucester in the household or in his castles for the next 10 years. Isabella wasn't permitted to remarry. John wanted to keep her lands, though he didn't want to keep her. In 1200, John decided to marry another Isabel, the French heiress, Isabel of Angoulême. But there was one problem. She was too young to marry. The chroniclers say, I suspect with a certain tinge of knowingness, that she appeared to be about 12 years old. But Isabella could have been as young as eight or nine. 
A previous betrothal to Hugh de Lusignan, a neighboring baron, had been postponed because of Isabel's youth. Hugh de Lusignan postponed the marriage until she should be old enough to marry. Then in comes John and takes her instead, ignoring the fact that she was not regarded as old enough to marry. He so alienated the local barons that thereafter the writing was on the wall and from that sprang the rebellions that then swept John's territories from northern France off the map. John's high-handed attitude to women would also have huge consequences for him in England. Having mistresses for a king is not lettery, that's just normal. The problem is that John goes after, against their will, the women in the families of the elite of society. Uh, he was accused of sexually harassing their wives and daughters. Robert Fitzwalter, for example, said that uh, King John tried to take his daughter by force. The other was William Longspade. Longspade had loyally gone out for John to fight for him at the Battle of Bouvain. He was captured, and while he was in captivity, John seduced his wife. I mean, all, all these kings were womanizers, but with John it had political consequences. Although only two years into his reign, John's reputation for treachery, greed and lustfulness was beginning to dominate and destroy the lives of his subjects. But no one could imagine that John would soon go down in history as the first English king to commit murder with his own hands. By 1199, John was King of England. Having betrayed his father, Henry II, and his brother, Richard the Lionheart, John was finally in possession of the throne he had always coveted. There isn't any reason, I think, why if, if uh, John had behaved moderately sensibly, uh, he shouldn't have continued to rule that huge empire. Almost immediately, though, John's right to rule that empire was under attack. In 1202, the legitimacy of his succession was challenged by his young nephew, Arthur of Brittany. There's no doubt that the challenge of kingship at the beginning of his reign causes John great problems. Although Arthur was the senior one in terms of descent, in every other respect, he was the junior one. He was much younger than John. He was only 12 years old when John becomes king of England. John succeeded in capturing Arthur and imprisoned him at Rouen in northern France. But in this moment of triumph, John made his greatest mistake. When you have to get rid of a member of the ruling family, it's a big, big deal to do it. And you generally try and find a legal process to go about it. John didn't do that. Accounts differ as to exactly what happened to Arthur, but it resulted in John being labelled as the first English king ever to commit murder. I think there is truth in this idea that John, in a drunken rage, simply lost his temper with Arthur. And I think John just flipped. That the red mist came down. It's a very, very stupid thing to do because the political values in, of the time in which John lived were values which said you cannot kill eight members of the elite. But John presumably thinks, oh, well, this is, you know, it's silly letting them go. They'll only come back and cause trouble again. I'm going to eliminate him. But it's just an example of John's clever deviousness, which is actually profound stupidity. The murder of Arthur was crucial. Uh, it stamped in people's minds this image of a tyrant, of a king, who would commit murder. The murder of Arthur of Brittany would dramatically affect the lives of those around him, and that of one man in particular, William de Bruce. We do know uh, that William de Bruce had been one of his most tr trusted counsellors for many years. De Bruce knew something about what had happened to Arthur. John decided in 1208 to turn against William de Bruce and to
confiscate his property, to drive him into poverty and exile. De Bruce fled to Ireland and then to France. Out of his reach, John vented his anger on De Bruce's family. First of all, he impoverished De Bruce's wife, Matilda, by imposing an unpayable tax on her. And John, I think, what was it, 50,000 marks, 33,000 pounds that John demanded from her, an utterly impossible sum, which she had to agree to. And then when the king's envoys come to get the first payment from her, all she has is about sort of 13 marks and a few pieces of gold. Having failed to make their payments, John imprisoned Matilda and her son in Corf Castle in Dorset. Here they were slowly starved to death. To starve her to, to, to death with her eldest son, it was just an appalling, terrible, terrible crime. It meant that all great landowners, pretty well all of whom were also in debt to the crown, had to fear that the law of the exchequer might suddenly be turned against them as it had been suddenly unleashed against William de Bruce. John was beginning to lose the trust and loyalty of his subjects. Crucially, when the French king, Philip Augustus, attacked John's French territories in 1203, John could only rely on paid mercenaries to fight for him. There are various references to these mercenaries pillaging the lands around, raping knights' wives, stealing peasants' carts. And this is given by, by contemporaries as one reason why John alienates some of the, the knights and barons who have until then been prepared to fight for him. Castle after castle fell to Philip Augustus. In the autumn of 1203, John fled to England, leaving his remaining castles in Normandy to fend for themselves. Within a couple of weeks, only three castles were holding out for John, but John fails to come back, and so these castles surrender, knowing that they won't receive any help from John. John would never regain his French territories. But throughout his reign, he continually raised armies to invade France. To pay for this, he imposed huge taxes on his English barons. The very, very large financial penalties that John asks of people certainly very greatly increases in this period. And therefore, the king can manipulate inheritances, technically the gift of the marriages of widows and heiresses are in his hands. And it's not because he wants the money, it's because he wants to have this hanging over you so that you know if you step out of line, the bailiffs are going to be in to get the money from you. You have to be reasonably sensible, perhaps even a good judge of human character, to be able to manage that political system well. But someone of John's character, I think, was clearly only able to make things even worse. Increasingly isolated and paranoid, John knew he could never expect his barons' automatic loyalty. So he decided to use fear to guarantee it. You need ways of compelling them to be loyal, whether they want to or not. Um, and so you can either as it were, get them in your debt and then say, well, look, I won't demand repayment, or more dr dramatic still, of course, is you hand over to me your daughters or your sons, or, and then I can be fairly sure of, of your loyalty. There was always the question, would the king actually kill the hostages? With John, after Arthur, um, well, the chances were that he might well kill the hostages. John did exactly that. In July 1212, he hanged 28 hostages, all of them sons of Welsh barons who threatened rebellion. Relations between John and his barons had deteriorated to such a degree that in 1212 there was a plot to assassinate him. And the idea was on the 1212 expedition to Wales to either to leave him to his fate or actually to kill him there. And I mean, John heard about it just in time, shut himself up in Nottingham Castle, didn't go on the Welsh expedition, and was clearly badly shaken. In 1215, that hostility would culminate in outright rebellion. Forty English barons, led by Robert Fitzwalter, decided to confront John with a set of demands, effectively limiting his power as the king. They had to 
come up with something totally unprecedented. They have to develop a new kind of banner for rebellion, a program of reform, a charter of liberties, and so we get Magna Carta. On June the 15th, 1215, at Runnymede near Windsor, John met with the barons to sign the Magna Carta, but he had no intention of abiding by it. What John did at Runnymede on the 15th of June, 1215, was suddenly to bring the negotiations to an end and say to the barons, that's it, that's your lot, take it or leave it. John's attitude made civil war inevitable. A brutal year-long campaign was waged throughout the country. In January 1216, John slaughtered the inhabitants of Berwick on the Scottish border as punishment for supporting the rebel barons. At Rochester in Kent, John personally directed the seven-week siege of this rebel stronghold. To torment the starving defenders even more, he ordered bacon fat to be smeared and burnt on the wooden props used to undermine the castle's west tower. The tower and the rebels' resolve soon collapsed. But total victory would elude him. In October 1216, whilst feasting at Lynn in East Anglia, he contracted dysentery. When he was dying, he clearly was a deeply, deeply troubled man. And you can see that from what he was buried in, because he wasn't buried in a crown. He was buried in a cloth cap. This is the cap which is put on a monarch's head after he's been anointed to keep in all the holy oil, all the oil which has poured into the monarch, the blessings of the Holy Spirit, it's what's called the cap of unction. It's an absolutely sacred garment. John clearly had kept his cap of unction and he asked to be buried in it in the hope that somehow or other the oil in it and the blessings would waft him as quickly as possible through the regions of purgatory. He died at Newark Castle in Lincolnshire on October the 18th, 1216. In his hurried will, he specified that his body should be interred at Worcester, where today the body of bad King John still lies in the cathedral. The most evil men and women in history takes a break next Monday because we've live international football. Football this Friday too, details of that in seconds. And next tonight, our Kevin Cosner season continues. Anthony Quinn and Madeline Stowe join Mr. C for the thriller Revenge after a news update.